415, we'll probably get started. I think the audio sounds okay. So uh, thank you for coming uh, late in the day on uh, last day of the, the, the sessions. I know everybody's probably tired, uh, but uh, again, really appreciate folks coming out and uh, listening to cross-functional teams. So my name is Jeff McWhorter. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Gravity Works Design and Development. We're a digital agency in the States. Uh, we are about 26 people right now. And I want to tell you a little bit about our journey as a company uh, and how we implement cross-functional teams, what they mean, um, and how it really helps us out at a, at a critical point in our business. So what are cross-functional teams? Uh, cross-functional teams, also known as multidisciplinary uh, teams, um, uh, were started in the 50s by an insurance company called Northwest Mutual out of the United States. Um, and they have different effects based on uh, the different types of business. Cross-functional teams inside of a product company are going to operate a little bit different inside of a consultancy. Um, a traditional cross-functional team uh, just really combines folks with different skill sets uh, to solve problems together. So a lot of times at product teams, you'll see uh, developers coming together with sales folks and accounting folks and marketing folks. Uh, uh, really areas that are out of their um, discipline to solve complex problems and create solutions. So one of uh, my biggest pet peeves at conferences is when um, folks start off a session and they spend the first 10 minutes talking about their company and uh, where they work, and then they talk about a session that has nothing to do with their company. So I've always strayed away from talking about my company, who we are, but I think in this case, it's, it's really important to understand our journey and who we are and, and why cross-functional teams um, helped us get to the point where we are today. So we're a consultancy, we're a digital agency. Uh, we make websites, uh, we make uh, mobile apps, uh, we just make cool things, digital things, and just really enjoy the craft of uh, software development and meeting people and cr solving problems and creating things. Uh, the company was started in 2009 with myself and uh, a business partner. Uh, she was the design side of the house, I was the back-end development side of the house. Uh, we just liked making things and we never thought that we would grow and we would have employees. So we worked in the company for about, uh, we started the company, we worked for about two months and realized that we couldn't work on our craft, we couldn't build websites and then have another website lined up. Sales, you had to have sales, you had to have that pipeline coming in. And we learned really quick that it wasn't just gonna be the two of us. So we hired somebody to help us out with some proposals. Um, and then from there, uh, we learned that uh, having somebody helping us out with sales and proposals drove more business. Uh, so then we needed another back-end developer, which led to another front-end developer, which led into more and more and more resources. Um, so it was really uh, growth is something that we really thought about early on. And how are we going to maintain culture? How are we going to be able to grow? Um, and really get into uh, you know, making a company at that point because when we started the company, we thought it was just gonna be us making websites and mobile apps. Um, how can we create um, an experience for everyone? Um, a keynote was really interesting um, when she was talking about vision and uh, does everybody in the company know the vision of the company? And, uh, you know, me being a founder, of course, I think, yeah, everybody knows the vision. And I have um, ideas to go back to the company and ask folks, do you really know the vision? And I hope people know that we wanted to develop a place where people just like to make cool things and keep that going. So we operated for about six years without cross-functional teams. And we thought it was fine. And then my business partner decided that uh, running a small business was not for her. She's had enough and uh, it was tough. And she left and she went to Accenture, very large consulting firm, global, thousands of people. So from a company that had about 10 people to thousands of people, um, she had just had enough. Um, so I was left with this company. Um, I bought her out of her, the contract. Um, and I'm left with this company and 
how it worked before were me and her were managing the projects. Um, at that point, I was still writing code, she was still writing code, but we were just juggling so many things, and then that's when it really dawned on us we really needed to change. So operated for about six years without cross-functional teams, and then in uh, 2000, uh, so we implemented them in 2015, um, and we used them for, you know, we've been using them ar around seven years now. So I'm going to show lots of different org charts that we've had um, since we've been implementing them. And uh, it's I, I love talking with folks from different organizations and having them um, define what their roles are. So what is a front-end developer in your company versus what is a project manager in, in, in your company? What are their roles? How do they differ? Um, so I think it's really important for, for me to go through and kind of define these roles so you understand um, what they are at Gravity Works and, and how they relate to, to your organization. Um, so the first role is a front-end developer. Um, we have the most front-end developers out of any role in our company. A uh, front-end developer um, is, I would classify it as an old-school front-end developer, HTML and CSS. Yep, I get that you know, new front-end developers are using React, they're using Vue, they have those things. But at our company, it's really front-end developers are HTML and CSS. Um, Back-end developers, C-sharp, PHP, um, going into the database, writing queries, and then they're the ones who are traditionally coming in to do the React, do the Vue, do the complicated JavaScript frameworks. Now that's not to say that's all projects. A lot of our job, uh, front end developers are getting more into the Vue and the React and whatnot, um, and they're pushing those back end developers into their traditional back end developer roles, um, creating modules and whatnot. But um, you know th that's for intensive purposes. That's kind of where we are. Project manager is the interesting one, um, and we've had a lot of shakeup in the last few months um, at our organization with project managers. Um, what I feel a project manager is, is a project manager is the gatekeeper of a project. Um, it is on the project manager to put their stamp of approval on a project before it goes out the door. Um, it's their responsibility to talk with the clients, um, work with them on requirements, maybe not like a full spec document or whatnot, but work with them, understand it. Um, and then maybe, you know, maybe you do have to go in, you know, we're a smaller company, maybe you do have to go in and add some content once in a while. Maybe you do have to go in and test something at the very end, it's your stamp of approval. But as um, we're growing as a company, we're starting to hire uh, project managers that are coming from larger organizations. Um, and I definitely apologize uh, for when our project managers, our, our new project managers are watching this, um, but they're paper pushers. They are literally pushing a schedule, they're looking at it, and then moving on to the next thing. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just we as a company need to adapt. We have a lead front-end developer. We have one individual who leads our front-end team. Um, we learned early on that uh, through trial and error, we don't want him working on specific projects. We want him coming in when there's problems. We want him uh, leading technology. We want him helping with architecture and leading the team and helping our other front-end developers advance their career. That's the same with the back-end developer, same type of role. UX manager um, is uh, somebody who is in management, uh, but definitely has a handle on UX. Uh, helps conduct research, helps uh, do lots of different things, uh, manages uh, content strategists and designers, and um, is more than just a manager for sure. Creative director in our organization, um, our creative director still does designs. He's inside, he's doing designs. Um, I think as we grow and we have more creative folks, I think that he will do more art direction and things like that, but as of right now, um, he's helping lead the, the, the vision of the company on the creative side, um, but he's still in there doing designs. Content strategists, um, <laughs> I, I, I wanna stay away from using a lot of idioms, um, but our employees uh, have multiple roles, and especially the smaller the company, the, the more roles you have, um, wearing multiple hats. Um, that's an interesting idiom that I'm assuming came from uh, police officers wearing hats and then a firefighter wearing a hat and who knows, um, but uh, just lots of different roles. But our content strategist at the heart is 
um, developing a, a strategy for a website, um, working with the clients to write content, um, and every once in a while they get pulled in and they have to, to, to do content, content entry as a site builder. Um, content entry site builder is definitely a newer role to us um, in the last couple couple months here. Um, it's a role that uh, in the Drupal community introduced me to 10 years ago, and I love this idea of site builders who are entering content and using modules and just putting the, together a site based on things. Um, and I'll get to them a little bit. Lead project manager, straightforward. They lead the, the, the project management team. Um, and then over on the right is, is kind of me, um, the chief operation officer um, and sales. Um, again, I come, I'm an entrepreneur. I come from a small organization where I'm used to wearing multiple hats. So I jump in and I um, push the broom when I need to push the broom to, to, to help out. Um, uh, so I, I still do a lot of the sales. Um, I do have some help internally, sometimes from other folks helping me with the sales, but I'm still doing the sales. And I'll get to, to that one in, in a little bit. So on paper, um, when we first implemented cross-functional teams, we were around 12 people. Um, and we're coming off of me buying out my business partner. Um, the, the company was kind of at a state where, um, you know, how, how is this going to look? Um, how is it going to work? How are we going to continue on when we had, you know, two figureheads of the company? Um, and we brought in a project manager um, to, to mainly replace my business partner. And um, he was really sharp. Um, he's still with the organization. He's our lead front-end developer, or lead uh, project manager right now. And he's the one who introduced us to cross-functional teams. And, um, you know, when it, like I said, it, it looks very clean on paper where we had this flat org chart where everybody reported up to me. I was responsible for doing um, employee evaluations and reviews. Um, I was responsible for having one-on-ones. If you had a problem with your insurance, um, you would come to me and ask me about insurance and benefits and all that sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I loved working 80 hours a week. It, it, it didn't really matter to me. I just enjoyed it. Um, project managers were doing what they did. They managed projects. They weren't managing people. I was the only one really managing people at this time. Front-end developers were off writing code and being happy. Back-end developers were off. Um, and then it was interesting over in the UX side, um, the content strategist and creative director. Um, so the creative director at this time was just the, our only creative. He was writing, doing the designs, um, working with the strategist, doing IA and whatnot. Um, but uh, it was great. It looked, looked awesome on paper. Um, but it really turned into a mess, um, mainly because what happened is that middle right there is project managers um, had a project, and you may have been working with uh, one front-end developer on one project, a different front-end developer on another project, and really we had one project manager that was working with all seven, eight of those, those front-end developers. Um, so they were really juggling a lot through there. Um, same situation with the back-end developers. Project managers were working with multiple back-end developers. The UX team was all over the board trying to work on things, and uh, it just was really tough. The biggest thing why we needed to use cross-functional teams was um, deadlines. Um, what would happen is this front-end developer would be working with this project manager and would get late on this project, which would delay the project that this project manager was working on which then delayed this project manager. So all of these deadlines started to get missed, and we were trying to bring in new, new clients and new things, and deadlines were getting missed. So I give you cross-functional teams version one. Oh, boy. Um, this was a while ago. Like I said, this was about seven years ago. Um, and where we get the cross here is um, on the, the left side. We have our project teams, which project teams consisted of a project manager and two front-end developers. Um, this team right here still had that front-end development team lead. Um, so we weren't able to get him off of the team um, because this project manager really liked that front-end developer um, and wanted him on his team. Um, so the cross is coming in here where we have front-end developer team project manager team, so we go project team, team, and then project managers down there. So our project teams are teams that are working on projects. Um, they're named, um, these, these names here coming down here, uh, team, 
Team RC, remote control. Team 9 to 5, um, it's Team 9 to 5, not because they work the hours between 9 to 5, but the Dolly Parton song, uh, the singer, 9 to 5. Um, and then Team Zeppelin. Um, I don't know where that name, Team Zeppelin, comes from, but uh, it's got a cool little icon there. UXicorns, um, they're not just unicorns, they're UXicorns. Um, so this was our UX team. Um, we introduced at this time a UX manager. So that UX manager was coming in to start doing a little bit of that people management. We realized that we needed not just um, project managers, but we needed people managers. Um, coming from open source, coming from agile methodologies, um, middle management just kind of really scared me. Um, I wanted to make sure that the roles that we had had value um, and it just wasn't there to be there. Um, so you'll see that the back end team leader wasn't on a team. He manages those developers. Um, the front end team lead was on a team. PM team lead was on a team. So again, we're still a small organization at this time. I think we're like maybe 15 people. Um, so we had to wear, you know, those multiple hats. We, we, we had those multiple roles and it was really tough for the, the PM team lead and especially the, the, the front end team lead to be able to, to, to manage two, four, six people, um, making sure that they're getting reviews, making sure that, uh, um, their career is being taken care of, but, and still be expected to, to deliver on, on projects and whatnot. Um, we had lots of conversations about back-end developers at this time um, when we first implemented this and should we put a back-end developer on each one of these teams and it was said um, that there's no way that we'll ever be able to get back-end developers on a team. It's just we have mobile apps that we're working on, we have uh, a couple .NET apps that we're working on, it's just really tough to, to, to get it in there. So we agreed and we treated them as a shared team. So the UX team was a shared team. The Misfit Toys um, is the back end developers team. Um, and they would come in on the project. You'd normally get like one, one back end developer on, on your project. They'd come in, they'd work, and then they'd move on to the next one. Um, and then the last one and on the bottom here, um, which is kind of the, the start of like a truly functional cross-functional team, is we had our operations team. So with my business partner leaving, I wanted to make sure that the company had a voice. Um, it wasn't just a dictatorship. It wasn't just me trying to lead this company into the future and do things. Um, so we created our operations team, which at the time was our PM team lead um, who introduced us to cross-functional teams, as well as our UX manager. So right away we saw the benefits from this. Uh, the biggest benefit were, was deadlines uh, tied to teams. Um, they're not tied to the company anymore. So what we found happening was um, we were meeting more of our deadlines. Um, inside the team we were still missing some deadlines, um, uh, but as a company as a whole, uh, we were meeting more of our deadlines. The work was more consistent. Um, when my business partner left, we had quality concerns. Um, I think I, I think you're not progressing as a company if you're not talking about quality and somebody saying we have quality concerns, but we had bigger quality concerns and breaking off into teams really put focus on employees to be able to look at what they were doing, have somebody reviewing their work. Um, it really helped us out to, to provide a better better service for the clients. Project managers now knew their strengths and weaknesses. That was really big. Um, when you're working with six other front-end developers, um, a lot of times you don't have the time to slow down, get to know your front-end developers, um, get to know where they're good, um, get to know where their weaknesses are, um, and be able to say, hey, why don't you go out to the team lead and ask for help? We know that, we str you've, that you've struggled with React before. Let's make sure that we're managing expectations. We set you up for success on this project and make sure that we're going in a good direction. Innovation and creativity. One of the big things that we were really worried about with cross-functional teams um, was competition. Um, you saw they each had a little logo, um, and that came against my advice. Um, the teams wanted to have 
have an identity. Um, but I thought what was going to happen is the teams would start competing against each other. I got five projects done this week. I got 15 projects done. I mean, from a management perspective, that's great, right? You, you're, you're setting up this competition with people going back. But that's not the kind of company that I wanted to, to develop. I wanted to make sure that people were being healthy. Um, they weren't working 80 hours a week. They're working you know, normal hours. Um, so I was really worried about that. But it led to innovation and creativity. That's where that, 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 that um, uh, competition came in, was seeing that this team is working on this cool project. Hey, can we get this cool project? Because we want to be able to do this. Employee engagement went through the roof. Um, I'm just one person, and uh, you know, smaller company, I wasn't able to have one-on-ones with, with many of the, the folks. Um, on the team, but this enabled it to um, that the the, the cross-functional teams gave two outlets. You had your project manager that you could go to and you could talk to them because they're responsible for your career and then your team lead, your front-end developer team lead because they're responsible for your career too, gave two outlets. Um, business agility, we were able to move quicker. Um, this one is one of my favorites, someone to advocate outside of the project space. So project managers, their jobs are to get projects done. Um, sometimes they think of people as um, resources. They're cogs in a wheel. And project managers are pushing to get projects done, to get things done. And uh, we at one point had one project manager who just pushed. And uh, somebody would ask for vacation, and the project manager would say, I don't think that works with our budget. Can you push it out? And again, that's not the kind of company that we wanted to have. Um, so vacation requests are not uh, approved by the project managers on the, on the project teams. They're approved on the, the functional team over on the, the specialty team. So the back-end developer lead, front-end developer lead, they're approving the vacations. That way, um, if a project is getting close to the deadline, and uh, somebody needs vacation, they still can have that vacation, and then um, maybe the project manager will wave their hands and yell, but then it's a conversation between the team lead and the project manager so that we're still thinking about people, and we're thinking of people as people, not resources. Um, a resource plan that can be forecast, forecasted, the true state of the company could now be completed. Oh man, we used to sit in these meetings on Fridays and uh, we called them the resource meetings and everybody would come and they were uncomfortable because we had that big mess of people and everybody you know, saying, I need this person for this many hours, I need this person. And when somebody wouldn't get, get the hours that they needed, they would pout, they would be upset, they would be mad. And it was just an uncomfortable meeting. Now you resource inside of your team, okay? Um, that's great if your project's being pushed out you got to call the client and you know if we need to get you more resources we'll have that but we could then create a, a true forecasting plan that we could resource out like six months oh this slide um our creative director uh, did the slides for us and uh, i think he saw the word specialty teams and thought of american football with the kicking team I am not a fan of American football. And he put a comment in my notes, and it says, could make football reference joke here for European football or not, or remove the player. Uh, I, I'm not going to remove the player, but I'm also not going to make a joke, but I much prefer European football than uh, American football. Anyway, project teams versus the, the specialty teams. Um, let's see what I have for notes here. I think I kind of talked with uh, most of these. And talk a little bit about meetings. So I think I have that in the next. I have another one. We can talk about meetings. So I guess I could have got rid of the, the football player altogether there. Maybe I should have did that. <laughs> OK, cross-functional teams version two. Um, so our, our, our cross-functional teams, we worked in with version one for about four years. Um, I don't think we had any major problems with it. Um, but four years into it, um, this is going about 2019, we hit the pandemic. And um, a lot of things were, were going on um, in the states. And we introduced another specialty team down here, um, our, our DEI team. 
um, because we wanted, you know, we, we had the question, do we feel as a company that we're doing enough? And the answer to that was no, we didn't feel that we were doing enough. So we created a team to do that. We still had the operations team. I just didn't have enough, to, enough room to put them down there. But specialty teams, we still had the operations team. We have uh, the DEI team. And the DEI team is the first time that we have somebody who is the leader of the team that's not managing people. Um, the leader is a front-end developer, um, and it's a true cross-functional team where there's front-end developers and project managers and myself and UX folks all coming together to talk about DEI things. Um, other interesting things on this is we have a new team, um, Team Jupiter. We had a, a large project come in uh, that uh, we needed another team for. So we ramped up really quickly. Uh, we hired uh, uh, a new project manager, and what we did was we took the new project manager and put that project manager on Team Zeppelin. Um, the PM team lead took Team Jupiter and two new front-end developers, and long and behold, we were able to pull out our front-end developer team lead out of uh, Team 9 to 5 there, and he was able to start doing what he does best. Um, leading the team, helping with hard problems. Um, yes, he is still booked more hours in the day than he possibly can be, but he's booked on the things that he probably should be working on. So going back to, to, to the teams and, and what happens with the teams, so the day-to-day the -day of the project team, um, we're a remote company, like most folks are nowadays. Um, and one of our keys to success uh, that we think is, is communication. And inside of Slack, we have a, a, a Slack channel called Daily Status. And the only, we don't want to put rules around it, but we just ask every morning when you come in and start work, just let us know what you're working on. And the idea for that is, um, we don't want to call you before you start work. We don't want to, uh, you know, bug you uh, if it's like a Slack thing that you can just talk. Project managers, team leads all know to look at that channel before they pick up a phone or try to DM you. Um, it's really to, to, to allow the middle management to leave you alone so that you can focus on, on your work. Um, that's morphed into folks do that in the mornings. Uh, when they get up to go walk the dogs, they say away from keyboard, going to walk the dogs. Uh, if uh, they take off for an eve take off early, taking off early, we'll be back on later tonight. Um, and it just works great because there's been a lot of times that, oh, I need to talk to this person. I go look in daily status, oh, they're away walking the dog. I don't bug them while they're away walking the dog, so it definitely gives them their privacy. Um, team, team stand up. Um, this is one that is implemented not on all teams. Not all teams want to do a stand-up every day. Um, some teams do a weekly meeting. Some teams will do a, uh, uh, um, th these are on the project side, um, will do uh, a weekly meeting versus a stand-up. On the specialty side, the front-end devs, the back-end devs, they all have their own meetings. They meet once a week. Um, UX team meets once a week. Project managers meet once a week. And the idea is they don't talk about specific projects. Projects come up, of course, but the idea is to talk about, look at this cool technology I use on this project, or, hey, I had this problem with this client on this, how would have you dealt with it on the, pro on the project management specialty team? They do client meetings, of course. Um, you know, I, I think like every organization, there's just way too many meetings. Um, we should really try to get rid of that, and then those daily stand-ups try to get rid of those and, uh, in many situations that we can. Dedicated time on new projects, and then dedicated time on support. Um, so this is the interesting one. So at a given time, a team's working, a project manager at Gravity Works is working between seven and ten projects, I would say. They're kind of juggling seven to ten projects, what we call active projects. Those are projects that uh, the UX team might be working on a sitemap for them. They might be in design. Uh, maybe the front-end developers are, are working on a project. Um, doing some code on it, um, maybe uh, a site's getting ready to launch, those are active. But we still have all of this technical debt from you know, 13, 14 years and being in business. Um, a lot of older clients, how do we deal with support? Um, this is something that, again, I'm getting a lot of pushback on recently, but right now the project stays with the project team. So if, you, if, if Team Zeppelin created a, a project 14 years ago and uh, we have new front-end developers on that team, um, they still maintain that project. 
the nice thing about that is if a front end developer leaves, you still have institutional knowledge of that project. Um, it's nice that that institutional knowledge is there because um, where I'm kind of getting at is eventually we want to implement a new team, a, a support team. And the support team gets all the support, support requests that are coming in. The problem with that is they lose all that institutional knowledge on that. A lot of times the requests that come in, two minute fix, done, two minute fix, done, and they're able to push it out a, a, a lot. Um, we have a couple teams that are really struggling with support where they have a lot bigger type issues that are coming in. Um, and I'll get to, um, you know, other teams hopping in to help out in those situations in a little bit. So when we first started implementing cross-functional teams, there was a lot of what ifs. Um, what if we get a new project manager? We, de have, we didn't have to deal with that um, until seven, eight years into doing cross-functional teams. Um, what I learned is um, it's okay, right? Um, we wanna make sure that your stay at our company, um, you're learning as much as you can, but we understand that you're gonna move to a different organization eventually. Um, what we found is the other team members on the team really stepped up to help fill the, the knowledge gap between the project manager. Um, the project manager team lead uh, took on that role so he was managing his, his role for his team that he it was still on a project team. Um, but he would uh, do the meetings, do the client meetings, start pushing things through. Um, and yeah, it was more work, more incentive to get somebody hired quickly to get them onboarded. Uh, when the new project manager was hired, um, uh, the, the front end developers were really able to get them up to speed really quickly because of that institutional knowledge. Um, so it's, it's a lot of benefit with institutional knowledge having, having these teams like this. Uh, the team is, is missing dates. Yep, uh, dates get missed all the time. Um, why were the dates missed? Um, is a lot of times we go back, we need to talk about that. Was it the client? Was it our fault? But if the t dates are missed in the team, it's just a date, right? It, it, it's, it's not affecting the whole company and it's not affecting the reputation across um, hundreds of projects anymore. It's just affecting that particular one. We have a difficult client. Um, this kind of is contrary to the institutional knowledge, but a trick in project management is if you have a difficult client, a lot of times what you can do is you can just switch the project manager and then all of a sudden that difficult client is, you know, clicks better, they get along better with the other project manager. Um, so we've done that and that's been beneficial in cases where we've just taken a project, moved it over to a different team, and then the project is an, an excellent project now. People like it, people are great, people are happy with it. We have a developer leave. Institutional knowledge, developers are gonna leave. It's okay if you leave. It's okay if you leave. I'll get teary, right? I have a couple of developers here and I sometimes I get emotional. But it's okay if, if you leave. Um, we wanna make sure that you have the best possible time while you're here. Um, and if you leave, you have some, another front end developer that has that institutional knowledge. You have that project manager. So we'll get through it. Um, I mixed those up. We get a new project. So. Um, we have a project manager leave, I talked about that, but we get a new project. Um, this really comes down to resourcing. Um, and there's a lot of emotion that comes into it. Uh, I, I, I think a lot of it is cognitive overload. And I think that um, the number seven feels like a lot of projects, but when you put it down on paper and you actually look at the number of hours that you're actually managing, maybe you're not spending that much time as you would think that you would need to on seven projects. So we look at our resourcing plan, I'm gonna show, show that in a little bit, um, to see which team seems like they could have um, uh, the availability to take on the new project, but then also you know, that cognitive load on the project manager. One project manager has 15 projects. Is it okay to give them another one? And it's really dependent on, on people. Um, and that kind of goes into we have too many projects. Um, I'll allude to, to some of that in a little bit on, on a couple different things. Okay, cross-functional teams version three. Um, let's see what's different here. Uh, remember when I said when we first implemented it that there was no way we would ever be able to get developers on a back-end team? Well, look at this. We have developers on back-end teams now. Um, it's working, um, you know, it, it just took some time to get some projects shifted and projects completed. Um, we have a team that does web stuff but also does our mobile stuff. Um, so that m the, the, the developer that is the mobile dev is on that team and he's able to get things done. The other interesting thing on here is all the way over on the right there, 
that project manager team lead. Oh, he's not out yet. That's a different one. Can't see. Sorry. The back end team lead. He got pulled out. So the back end team lead is out um, doing what he needs to do, managing careers, helping people out. And look at that UXicorn team. That one has grown. So there's another designer in there. Um, the content strategist is still there, but now there's two site builders inside of there too. So we've seen a big increase with UX and needing to do UX type things. Um, process team, um, still the DEI, same folks on the DEI team, and then the operations team still kind of chugging along there. So the difference between V3 and V4 moved really quickly. As soon as we got developers on back-end teams, folks really saw that you know, we need to change things up. We need to get this back into traditionally have, um, have these crosses and have teams and have these project teams. Um, we pretty much pulled everybody out of the UX team, and we're trying something new. New as in this is like in the last two weeks we started working on, on this plan right here. Um, we have a dedicated designer that is shared only between two teams. Um, so that creative director is on two teams, the designer's on two teams. Same with the site builder, the site builder is being shared by two teams. Um, this is limiting that, that project management of, of people going back and forth with different things there. Um, and this has definitely seemed to help. Um, this is where we've been able to pull um, that project manager out of the um, actual team so that they're able to, if we do lose a project manager, they're going to be able to um, help a little bit more with uh, the duties and, and work on that. Um, and this is, you know, now getting much cleaner and where I would expect something like this. Um, what's happening though, um, I'll show you the kind of ideal situation. Actually, I'm going to skip that for now. It's kind of funny what's happening as we're starting to get uh, more people on, on each team here. So Harvard Business Review uh, did a study, and there's a link in, in, my, in my text, in the slides here, that say 75% of, of cross-functional teams are dysfunctional. Um, I'm glad they used the word dysfunctional and not the word fail, failures, um, because I think the word failure is different on, depending on who you ask. Um, so the criteria is meeting a, a, on three of the, these five criteria, criteria they failed. Um, meeting a planned budget, staying on schedule, adhering to specs, meeting customer expectations, um, and a ma maintaining alignment with companies' corporate goals. So they fail on at least three of those. Um, meeting a planned budget, um, budgets are hard, right? And I think that um, one, of, one of the ways that we're successful with managing projects is um, we try to take money out of the equation as much as we can. Um, yes, we need to have money to, to survive and grow our company and do things, but that's going to be the biggest contention a lot of times is um, we come back and say we need you know, 100 more hours. Well, why do you need 100 more hours? And then we justify different reasons for it. It's not to say if somebody changes the spec on us, we're going to go back and say, you know, we need more money. Definitely we'll do that in that situation. But a lot of times, you know, we're over what we planned on because software developers are not great at estimating. I don't think anybody's great at estimating. Um, I have two children. I have a seven and a ten-year-old, and I've started early. I've said, how long does it take to walk to school? How long does it take to get to the grocery store? How, how, you know, we constantly do these things to learn how to estimate because human nature, we're just not good at estimating. So definitely, we at Gravity Works, um, we go over budget a lot. Um, staying on schedule, um, I think that you have picked up that we're laxed on schedules sometimes. Um, we're laxed on schedules sometimes because we value doing it right versus getting it out the door. Um, adhering to specs, um, if the specs are correctly collected, which um, is tough to make sure that you're getting everything out of a client and, you know, all up front, agile, whatever, um, we follow specs, we'll do that. Um, meeting customer expectations, yeah. So I think, you know, for the most part, I think that we are functional. I think I would like to say that our, our cross-functional teams are functional, but I think that there's dysfunction in, in, in everything that you really do. 
So the keys to success with cross-functional teams, um, you need to define a leader. You noticed in, in the DEI team, it doesn't need to be a people manager. It just needs to be somebody who's passionate and can lead the team that they're working on. Clear goals. Project teams, very clear goals. We're going to work on projects. Front end teams, we're going to develop your career and make you the best front end developers we possibly can. Um, knowledge sharing between the teams. We have um, cross-functional meetings where back-end developers are meeting with the back uh, front-end team. UX teams meeting with the back-end team, and it's crossing over and doing these meetings. Um, sometimes it's, it's very difficult uh, to get people to give agendas on what you want to talk about, but at the end of the day, when those meetings happen, they're, they're just great information to, to get people together and have um, innovation and creativity. No competition. We're one unit. We are one company working towards our goals to do great things. Um, let's see. Uh, the team must have both authority and accountability. Super important, um, especially with the project managers, to be able to give them authority to um, uh, reduce the, tell the client, we'll credit you this amount, or give them more, more hours. They have to have the, the ability to be able to do that. Um, and adequate communications must exist. Um, you know, in essence, we're building silos, right? We're building these silos of, of our front-end developers and back-end developers, so there has to be communication across those silos, and we get that, and it's okay to build silos. We're okay with that in this situation because we communicate back and forth. So kind of going into the end here, um, wrapping up with some of the problems that we've encountered. Um, team members can get bored. Um, making sure that they're working on projects that excite them is very important. Um, it's not obvious when to scale a team up. Um, we talk about a project manager can handle, you know, 10 projects, um, but the project manager has two front-end developers, and they're working on things, and they're light, and when do you get another front-end developer on the team? Sometimes it's not obvious on when to scale up. can lead to many meetings. Um, this is something that we struggle with in our organization, like like lots of other organizations. Um, support can derail a project. We talked about that. You know, a big support thing coming in can, can affect timelines on things. Um, we don't do a great job sharing the success of a project um, team to the entire team. So we have a, a weekly meeting on Tuesdays where all of us in the company get together, we chat and whatnot, um, but we don't do a great job about project launches and, and the success of an individual team. So I'm going to rush through um, the last couple here. Um, we use Asana for task management, um, and this is a portfolio uh, for a team. Um, this is actually team 9 to 5 uh, for last week. Um, and you can kind of see that uh, it's great. The forecasting is, is going out great for a week, but it's not six months. For an individual, we can drill into an individual. Uh, we can see we track holidays, um, vacation and holidays. So going to DrupalCon Europe is definitely a vacation. It's, it's not work. It's not hard, right? No. It's definitely hard. It is very hard work. Um, here's maintenance. So this is n a, a client that is a bigger type client. Um, we forecast that this client is going to take roughly five hours a week. So we just kind of put that across there. So if those hours come in, great, we have it. If they don't, we can put it someplace else. So the last kind of slide that I have here is cross-functional, the future. I kind of laughed and kind of giggled a little bit. and looks like the slide's getting a little bit cut off there. But um, I think given um, giving the opportunity, folks would like to have every single role on every single team. They would like to have multiple front-end developers, maybe even multiple back-end developers, a UX designer, a site builder. They'd like to have uh, uh, a business analyst, uh, customer experience, a QA person. Where does it end? How much money do we have to spend to put to, to make these sort of teams on here? So I think that as the company grows and it gets into this, what makes sense? Um, because we are looking at hiring a business analyst, but can a business analyst Hire the, handle the amount of projects that we have? Are we going to overwhelm that business analyst so fast that we have to hire a second business analyst right away and kind of do that, do the thing that we're doing right now with site builders where they're kind of balanced between the teams? So um, definitely some challenges that we're looking at into the future. So I think I'm going to 
at about time, but I have some time for questions here. Uh, so thanks, everybody, for having me. How do you deal with missed deadlines with clients? How do you deal with missed deadlines with clients? Um, ideally, we want to have the conversation up front um, and have it early as possible um, and have good reasoning behind it. We try to avoid things, um, like if the project is around uh, a holiday, we make sure that we have conversations to say that, you know, we're going to have these folks out when vacation comes up, we let the client know. Um, this was an interesting situation recently. We had a client where it was two months before their launch date, and um, we told them, um, we're not going to be able to meet your launch date, but we're able to provide you with um, a subset of, of functionality. Um, the client called us incompetent. It was not their fault that we were missing the deadline. It was our fault because we were incompetent. Um, and what we needed to do in that situation, because we couldn't push the deadline out, is we borrowed front-end developers from other teams to come in to meet it. But luckily, we gave, you know, we gave the client two, it was like two or three months notice that we weren't going to meet this date, so we still had plenty of time to pull from those other teams, um, which we don't like to do because it affects those other projects, but we were able to shift sh schedules and some other things to, to do that. Um, so we don't like to miss deadlines. And that project, um, we did release with a reduced scope level. Um, but the things that we're missing were just a couple features and we were able to get it out in the next couple weeks. And uh, this is the first time that the developer is hearing that the client called us incompetent, so mm -hmm. we kind of shielded you from that. Yeah. Um, Sure. So if, uh, if a developer is on, on sick leave or vacation, um, how do we handle that? Um, bigger, bigger ones like uh, maternity leave and things like that, we want to make sure that we have it scheduled and we pr find a replacement to make sure that we're able to handle that. Um, short term, two weeks, three weeks, um, we really try to focus in the project and let the client know. Um, we know that clients want to get things done quickly and everything, um, but at the end of the day, the sites that we're working on, they're websites. They're not medical sites. They're not emergencies that you absolutely have this out. So we really try to get a lot of understanding from them to say, if we have this person that they're out, it's going to stretch your deadline a week. Um, we can pull somebody in if we absolutely have to, but are you okay with it? But just being human and being you know, open a lot of times handles that. Sure. So the question was, um, do we have a, a solution architect um, that is part of a shared team that kind of goes through e each one of those? Um, it, that that kind of goes to the back-end developer role, the, the lead back-end developer role, and the, the lead front-end developer role. And that's why it was important for us to kind of split those out of those, those teams so that when those big projects come in, they have the availability to hop on that, to work together as a back-end developer and a front-end developer, develop the solution, and then work with the, the specific project team, and then move on to the next team. And you don't have a lead tester, right? We do not have a lead tester. So that, we like to say that if you wrote the code, you should have somebody else testing it. So uh, back-end developers will test their code sometimes, front-end developers go back and forth, um, but that kind of goes to that beginning statement of the, the unique project managers that we had that they put their stamp, the seal of approval on. If you have good specs and, and the developers are writing test plans and, and everything, a lot, of time, a lot of situations our project managers were going through and doing those testings. But, I think that's a really hot topic lately, especially at our organization, and we've looking looking into that more because, like right now, um, cross browser testing is done by the developers, the front end developers. Accessibility testing actually goes up into the UX department because we have folks who know how to do that. Um, so I think having somebody dedicated to that, but then that leads to the question: If you have one tester, are they going to be able to handle the the 30 projects you need 
two testers or four testers to, to work in this environment. Our, oh, question. Sure. So, so the comment was uh, um, recommending against a dedicated support team, um, keeping it inside of the teams, um, mainly because uh, a lot of organizations put the junior people on, on the support teams. Uh, there you, you lose the institutional knowledge. Um, no, I agree with that 100%. And it's, it's constantly going to be people fighting to get out of the support role and get onto, I want new projects. And it's nice to have a balance. Um, you know, when I was a developer, I liked having that balance. I liked working, you know, on a new project. And then, oh man, this thing came in and I have to spend four hours trying to figure out something I wrote 10 years ago. I, I used to enjoy that, but not everybody's the same. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a great rest of your conference. <laughs>